Memento mori, Latin for remember that you die. This phrase has rung throughout much of history, both verbally as well as symbolically, with the most common iteration of it coming in the shape of a human skull. This has taken many iterations over the centuries, usually through the form of storytelling, art, and warfare. But today we're going to be looking at one that started as an element of storytelling and art, but has since been adopted for warfare, as well as a wide variety of ideas, movements, and groups. That symbol, the skull of Marvel Comics anti-hero vigilante, the Punisher. Now, before we start, it should be said that this is something of a different topic than the ones we usually talk about, as it blends the real world with the fictional one, and doesn't necessarily cover a piece or uniform, but rather a symbol that has turned into something that's transcended the original use in comic books, movies, TV shows, apparel, and general merchandise into something much larger. With that being said, chances are you've heard of the Punisher, or at least seen in some way his logo, a simple yet distinctive white skull often on a black background, specifically the version that features a more bulbous top and sharp and narrow bottom. In recent years, it has shown up all over the world, not only because of Marvel comics, games, TV shows, and the apparel tied to them, but also because of its adoption with military forces, police, and non-state entities such as militias, political supporters, and other private groups. This has led to a number of controversies of varying scales that usually are based on the original meaning of the symbol being lost due to its adoption by many of these individuals and movements. But to best understand the situation, we first must look at the origin of the Punisher and what his symbol initially stood for. The character of the Punisher, real name Francis Castiglione, but usually shortened to Frank Castle, was first introduced by the Amazing Spider-Man writer Jerry Conway. First appearing in 1974's Amazing Spider-Man issue 129, he was hired by the newly introduced villain, the Jackal, to kill Spider-Man under the pretenses that he was just another criminal. After discovering the Jackal was using him with the ultimate goal to frame him for murder, the Punisher vowed to get his revenge against him before hastily leaving. From there, he would appear in a few more Spider-Man issues and one-shots, those being standalone comics or short story arcs, before gaining his own ongoing series in 1987. Now, his background story is pretty grim. A Marine Corps veteran, initially depicted as a Vietnam War vet and then later on a War on Terror veteran, such as in the Netflix show, returns home only to have his family murdered in New York City's Central Park by the mob because of them witnessing a hit. With traditional and official means such as the police and courts leading to nothing as far as bringing anyone responsible to justice, Frank feels the entire system has failed, resulting in him becoming something of a vigilante with the unending goal of taking down criminals of all calibers, oftentimes through at the minimum questionable and at the maximum lethal means. With this modus operandi as an anti-hero, he frequently butts heads with other Marvel superheroes, which has caused quite a few conflicts and stories over the years. As a means to identify himself, he adopted the white skull symbol, which was often seen on his shirts, suits, vests, or body armor. The in-comic origin of the logo was changed a few times in different storylines, but the main one comes from a story arc within the comic series The Nam, which sees Castle tasked with eliminating a Vietnamese sniper by the name of the Monkey. In that story, the Monkey wore and kissed a monkey's skull for good luck. Castle used the image of it as a way to taunt the sniper before eventually killing him and completing his mission. After becoming the Punisher, he would adopt it as a throwback and as a way to distract and intimidate his enemies, as it would also serve as a way to identify himself and focus fire towards his torso rather than head where he'd usually have some form of body armor. This was the case for a number of years as the skull symbol varied due to different outfits, comic series, and movies, excluding the 1989 Dolph Lundgren film, which omitted it entirely. But why was the skull chosen as his logo instead of literally anything else? Well, the symbol of the skull has quite a history in the real world. Usually accompanied with crossed bones, the symbol of the skull often denotes a level of death, defying death, or danger, and as such is used in varying ways to intimidate the user's enemies. Two major examples of this were the various iterations of the Jolly Roger and Totenkopf. The Jolly Roger was a sort of blanket term for various flags flown by pirates during the early and mid-1700s. These flags often featured a black background with a white skull and crossbones, skeletons, swords, and other weapons, or other macabre-looking symbols. Famous pirates ranging from Calico Jack, Steed Bonnet, Black Bart, and even Blackbeard flew flags that depicted either a skull or death itself, 
as a form of identification and to project a level of intimidation and fear to anyone they may have set their sights on. However, the use of the skull on warriors and soldiers came in a major way with the second instance. During the time of Prussian King Frederick the Great, that being 1740 to 1786, a Hussar Cavalry Regiment was formed, which adopted the symbol of a skull and crossbones, along with black uniforms, as a way to remember and honor King William I, who had died in 1740. Known as the Totenkopf, meaning death's head, dead person's head, or simply skull, it shared the same meaning as the Jolly Roger symbol found across the pirating world. However, instead of it being on giant flags and banners, these were seen in the form of smaller pins and insignia, often seen on hats. As time progressed, units would change, but the Totenkopf remained seeing minor changes in its dimensions and looks, but always keeping its core skull and crossbone components. For the next 200 or so years, the symbol survived numerous uniform reforms, changes in territories, nations, and governments, with one of its final iterations, as far as Germany goes, being seen during the 1920s and early 30s, where the logo was once again adopted, this time as part of the uniforms of the Stabschwache, a small unit of the SA tasked with guarding Adolf Hitler. As the 1930s turned to the 1940s, the symbol grew in usage and popularity, becoming one of the main ones of the SS, and according to its leader, Heinrich Himmler, the skull was used as a reminder that you shall always be willing to put yourself at stake for the life of the whole community. This sentiment wasn't new though, as the original symbolism echoed this almost 200 years prior, as it also showed loyalty and commitment wearers had to the empire that went as far as giving up one's life in service to it. After the war, it was mostly retired by Germany, but continued to be a go-to symbol of sorts for different forces and units through individual and moderate usage of patches, insignia, and banners, which were mostly unofficial in nature. So to essentially summarize, between the Jolly Roger and Totenkopf symbols, as well as just the basic look of a skull and crossbones, the idea boils down to it being an image that either displays or warns of death, dying, or danger, or when used by armed forces or warriors to evoke fear and intimidation, as oftentimes the skull symbolizes that the wearers are aware of death and may not necessarily fear it. So, with the Punisher being a vigilante with often suicidal tendencies, such a symbol was perfect for him, and thus the look of a solid white skull was chosen. Now, with Castle showing up in a number of stories both on and off the page since the 1970s, his overall look has changed a few times, and because of that, so has the skull. For example, in some instances, it's wider and takes up almost his entire torso, whereas others, the magazine pouches on his belts are the actual teeth of the skull. However, the iteration that is most common and familiar to people nowadays first showed up in the 2004 film starring Thomas Jane. In it, Frank's son gives him a t-shirt featuring the skull while on vacation in Puerto Rico, saying it's a symbol that is supposed to ward off evil. Not long after, due to Frank being indirectly involved in the death of a Tampa mob boss's son, the entire Castle family, who are all together for a family reunion, are gunned down with Frank being the sole survivor. After a long recovery, he finds the shirt and dons it as a part of his new identity as the Punisher. Now, movie-wise, many felt this 2004 iteration was somewhat accurate to the character, with it overall having mixed responses critically while receiving lukewarm box office numbers. However, thanks to home release on VHS and DVD, an unexpected result would be the massive resurgence in popularity of not only the character, but the distinct design of the skull he wore, which would quickly transcend the comic book and movie worlds. As the movie was being released, the global war on terror had only recently begun, with the US invasion of Iraq initiating only a year prior. Because of this, a number of US troops were already deployed all over Iraq and Afghanistan. One of these personnel was a communications operator of Charlie Platoon, also referred to as Cadillac Platoon, of SEAL Team 3, which included now famous sniper Chris Kyle. Upon their deployment to Iraq, they gave themselves the nickname of the Punishers and adopted the skull logo seen in the movie. This was best explained by Kyle himself who brought it up in his book American Sniper. A movie by the same name had just come out. The Punisher wore a shirt with a stylized white skull. Our comms guy suggested it before the deployment. We all thought what the Punisher did was cool. He righted wrongs, he killed bad guys, he made wrongdoers fear him. He went on to say how they slightly modified the logo and began to spray paint it all over their gear and equipment such as helmets, body armor, weapons, and even their Humvees. 
In addition, it became something of a calling card for them, as the symbol was left on buildings and other structures, wherever the unit operated as a sort of psychological fear tactic to any insurgents or forces that were fighting against them at the time. Now, this was the catalyst of the skull being catapulted beyond the direct connection to the character, but it's worth noting that the Punisher's influence among the military community can actually be traced back to the late 1980s. During one of the earlier runs of the comics, there was a section towards the back of many issues called Punishing Males where fans could write in with questions or comments about the publication and have them answered by artists, writers, and others associated with the comic. One interesting exchange was found at the back of issue number eight when Sergeant M. Clay wrote in telling of how he was a big fan who appreciated the series, as well as pointed out a few discrepancies seen in past issues. Though this was a very small instance, it did show that Frank Castle had his fans among the troops, and it has been said that many got tattoos of various depictions of the skull, with some others apparently even using it in small ways as far as uniforms go. Anyway though, between the increase in popularity of the Punisher and the notoriety of Chris Kyle and the other Navy SEALs, the logo quickly took hold among various military communities in a much larger way. It was so well received by US forces in Iraq, a sister platoon within SEAL Team 3 had asked to use it, but were denied as Charlie Platoon said it was theirs and that they needed to create and adopt their own. After retiring from active duty, Kyle helped establish the company Kraft International, which took the skull as its logo and added a crosshair over the left eye, as well as the word craft on the forehead. However, keeping within the military, the SEAL's initial denial didn't stop the tide as the Punisher symbol spread throughout the country by way of US, coalition, and eventually Iraqi forces in the following years. Around the same time of SEAL Team 3's usage, another version of it was spotted by way of the 24th Infantry Regiment's Deuce 4 skull. This symbol wasn't used so much as an unofficial insignia for morale purposes, but rather a psychological calling card of sorts, as it was left on buildings where enemy combatants fighting against the 24th had been killed. Though it seemed to have resonated a little more with certain soldiers, as photos did show it on mounted weapons, as well as in the form of tattoos. A few years later, this idea of using the symbol as a marker found its way to Afghanistan by way of Norway's Telemark Battalion, a mechanized infantry unit, which saw certain members spray paint the skull on the homes of suspected Taliban as a way to identify and intimidate them. In addition, a circular patch surrounded by the words Yuke, we will never forget, was worn by others. This patch doubled as a way to honor Grenadier Class Joachim Olsen, who was killed by a roadside bomb in January of 2010. Although both of these actions were deemed forbidden by the Norwegian military, both, more so the wearing of the patch, continued to sporadically be seen over the next few years. Jumping back to Iraq though, numerous members of the military and other security forces have adopted the logo to varying extents. With some seen as early as 2007, the logo appears to have had a resurgence during the war against ISIS, starting in the mid-2010s being used by not only official military units, but paramilitary and militia groups as well. This adoption though is something of an interesting one, as the reference to the character is largely absent, as Iraqi users use the symbol much the same way pirates and soldiers of the past used the Jolly Roger or Totenkopf. With its popularity cemented among the armed forces community around the globe, it was only a matter of time until there would be some form of kickback, such as the Australians and British banning the symbol to varying extents. We'll address this again towards the end, as during this time it was also becoming popular among another community, law enforcement. Seen primarily within North America, the logo started off on a small scale, being seen in somewhat isolated cases. However, it would almost immediately become associated with controversy. One of the earliest incidents was in 2004, the same year as the release of the Thomas Jane movie, where a small group of police officers inside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, formed an alleged unsanctioned group within the police force known as the Punishers. This group, which was claimed to have engaged in vigilante-style justice, would identify themselves by wearing all black gloves and hats featuring a skull, along with a few suspected members having skull tattoos and stickers on their lockers, trucks, and memo books as well. The Punishers began being investigated shortly after the 2004 beating of Frank Jude Jr., which involved a number of off-duty officers assaulting Jude at a housewarming party over a badge and wallet that was believed to have been stolen by him and his friend. A few of the officers involved were alleged members of the Punishers, though after a series of investigations in the following years, it appears nothing major ever came of it. For the most part, this instance appeared to be an isolated case as far as law enforcement use went. However, that would change though come 2014 when the group Black Lives Matter, with a mission statement of addressing, preventing, and protesting racial violence and police brutality against black people, was established. As a sort of counter-movement, many who actively supported law enforcement personnel 
formed a group known as Blue Lives Matter, which was all about police advocacy, from helping officers and their families during times of need, to the lobbying of having individuals charged and convicted of killing police officers being sentenced under the same laws as hate crimes. As the Blue Lives Matter and law enforcement supporters became more vocal, they would often show their support by way of the Thin Blue Line flag, an altered United States flag that featured common police colors of black, gray, white, and blue. This would make its way onto not only patches, stickers, and decals, but also clothing of all sorts. At some point, the Punisher's skull would become intertwined into it, seeing the flag mirrored and flipped 90 degrees, then incorporated within it. With this new remix of the logo, many police officers began to see the Punisher skull as a symbol of law enforcement, and as a result began to use it as such. The first big instance of this came in December of 2016 when the police department in Catlettsburg, Kentucky added onto their squad car hoods a version of the skull with the thin blue line flag and the words Blue Lives Matter written on top of it. This was seen positively by some, but overall many questioned why the Punisher symbol let alone a skull in general, should be seen on police vehicles. Chief of the department, Cameron Logan, who had designed and overseen the application of the decal, said, That design is basically to give back to the police officers. Our lives matter just as much as anybody's. I'm not a racist or anything like that. I'm not trying to stir anything up like that. I consider it to be a warrior logo. Just because it has blue lives matter on the hood, all lives matter. That decal represents that we take any means necessary to keep our community safe. After an article on the decals went viral, the backlash and criticisms of it both locally and nationally eventually led to its removal in February of 2017. Arguments against it ranged from the imagery of death and a fictional murderer being associated with police to copyright infringement as the logo is owned by Marvel Comics. However, it would continue to pop up among various police departments all over the U.S. in the following months and years. A few examples were, the same Blue Lives Matter version of the skull, though in a much smaller size, being added to squad cars of the Solvay, New York Police Department in April 2017. After finding out about them via email, the mayor of the town investigated and deemed them appropriate enough to remain on. When the Police Officers Association of St. Louis, Missouri requested its members in July of 2019 to change their social media pictures to it as a sign of solidarity, while certain officers were being investigated for posts and images made or shared by them online, St. Louis's police commissioner responded via a memo opposing the action, stating, The Punisher logo does not coincide with our mission to protect life and property and achieve a peaceful society. Jerry Conway, the co-founder of this comic character, has himself stated that the Punisher represents a failure of the justice system. In June 2020, when certain Detroit police officers were spotted during the George Floyd protests wearing on their shoulders and vests black and green patches with the skull, in September of 2020, when a police officer who was attending a news conference about traffic safety in Toronto, Ontario, wore a patch with the skull, a Canadian flag with the thin blue line incorporated into it, and the words, make no mistake, I am the sheepdog written around it. The officer was identified and told that he could not wear patches on his uniform that were not approved by the department. Next were two instances of New York Police Department officers wearing accessories with the symbol on it. One in November of 2020 when an officer wore a mask with the Blue Lives Matter version, and one in February of 2021 where a sergeant was spotted at a Black Lives Matter protest wearing two patches, both of which depicted a U.S. President Donald Trump-themed skull. Finally, one of the most questionable police uses didn't come from Canada or the United States, but rather Venezuela. In 2017, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro created the Special Actions Force of the Venezuelan National Police, often known by the Spanish acronym of FAES. This unit, according to the government, is tasked with combating crime and terrorism. With some units sporting a blue urban digital camouflage, they are often accompanied by a patch on the shoulder which includes the Punisher skull. Since its activation, groups such as the human rights organization Provea, as well as the United Nations, have found evidence that FAES has terrorized, tortured, and murdered thousands, leading it to be labeled by some as a sort of government secret police and death squad used to quell any sort of dissent. Now, with the logo originally being in the public sphere of influence, it was only natural the skull would end up becoming adopted by more citizen-based groups. However, the ones where it became most popular were often ones many felt it had no place going, that of militias and radical groups, some of which were and still are affiliated with white supremacy and or have anti-government sentiment. On August 11, 2017, the Unite the Right rally was held in Charlottesville, Virginia. A direct result of the removal of certain Confederate monuments, the protest drew a number of militias from the states of Virginia, New York, and Pennsylvania, 
along with various radical groups ranging from neo-Nazis and Confederates to the Ku Klux Klan, to name a few. As a response, a large group of counter-protesters came to confront them, and over the course of that weekend, these groups clashed with one another, resulting in numerous injuries and one death. While this was happening, protesters on both sides carried a swath of signs and regalia denoting all sorts of messages and symbols. One that was spotted was that of a white skull with an outstretched lower jaw. Though not the same as the Punisher symbol, popularized by the 2004 movie, people speculated it was inspired by it. Through things like patches, hats, shirts, clothing, and all sorts of accessories, many members of these militias and radical or hardliner groups began to be seen with the now instantly recognizable skull. One of the largest was that of the Three Percenters, a U.S.-Canadian-based group which took the name from the belief that only 3% of the population of the original 13 colonies fought against the British during the American Revolution, they are most known for their advocacy of gun rights along with holding anti-federal government sentiment. During its first few years of operation, the group tried to trademark the Punisher skull with the teeth in the form of three Roman numerals for use in their online store. Though this ultimately failed, the logo did go on to be remixed a few times, being seen on a variety of decals, accessories, and other symbols for the movement, with the three numerals often being moved around within the skull. Now, militias and alt-right groups weren't the only ones appropriating it around this time. In 2016, Donald J. Trump was elected as the 45th President of the United States. Through his one term in office, a number of events transpired that saw the Punisher skull co-opted for different uses, such as the above-mentioned Unite the Right. However, one that directly tied to him came during the 2020 presidential election. Much like his 2016 run, Trump went back to things that made him president in the first place campaigning, slogans, and easily recognizable paraphernalia. Because of this, many opportunistic individuals and groups realized that a large chunk of his more heavily devoted base were eager to display their support for him. Through things like hats, flags, pins, clothing, masks, and your run-of-the-mill campaign supplies, this was done. However, one of the more interesting items was that of the Punisher skull. Sometimes referred to as the Trumpisher, or Punisher Trump, this version adds Trump's blonde hair to the skull. Oftentimes, it will also include the US flag, Trump 2020, the acronym MAGA, and a number of other campaign-related details or slogans. These would be most popular in the form of decals added to individuals, cars, and trucks. Along with the numerous other variations, the Punisher skull made a big splash during the 2020 election season, ranging from them being seen on cars driving over campaign signs, to Fox News show host Sean Hannity donning one during his show for a time in the form of a lapel pin. But it didn't stop there. As the skull permeated into politics, it started to be picked up not only by Trump supporters, but also conspiracy theorists. In 2017, the decentralized movement called QAnon began. Named after a conspiracy theory partially stemming from a series of anonymous cryptic posts left on websites like 4chan by a user simply referred to as Q, a reference to the highest security clearance within the U.S. Department of Energy, Q level, it is considered by some as a cult, which holds a number of controversial beliefs and goals. The main one was pretty straightforward, believing that some sort of secret deep state cabal was influencing the government while trying to actively oppose and hinder President Trump during his time in office. The others, though, get a bit extensive, as they stem from the idea that said cabal is actually made up of satanic cannibalistic pedophiles who actively engage in sex trafficking. Anyway, though, as the election drew closer and closer, believers and supporters of this group would be seen at rallies and events, often flying flags and holding signs that displayed a rather simple symbol of the movement, a giant uppercase Q. But being that the group was a decentralized one, members showed their support differently. During a Tampa Bay, Florida rally held in January of 2020, a call to action and recruitment flyer was passed out. At the bottom, the skull was spotted. Much like the other versions before it, the QAnon skull took off being seen on flags, patches, shirts, decals, and so on, usually within the Q or alongside the acronym WWG1WGA, which stands for Where We Go One, We Go All. Now, the appropriation and evolution of the skull more or less came to a head on January 6, 2021. Before this point, many had decried the fact that the Punisher logo, one that they felt should remain within the universe of Marvel content, had become synonymous with various other groups and movements which were using it incorrectly and for the wrong reasons. However, come this date, that argument gained quite a bit more attention and even led to some saying that the logo should be retired. In the United States, January 6th is the day that all of the electoral votes during a presidential election are verified by Congress. 
essentially making it the last step before either an incumbent president begins his second term or a new president is sworn into office. With Joseph Biden winning both the popular and electoral votes, he had been confirmed the winner after a long and drawn out process caused by those who believed the election had been fraudulent and rigged. Because of this, numerous hardliner Trump supporters refused the results and had met up in the capital of Washington, D.C. for a rally held by President Trump and a number of his allies and campaign staff. Soon, though, a large portion of the people who attended said rally made their way over to the Capitol building. Met by police, things quickly got violent and the building was stormed. With all sorts of phones, cameras, and news teams on the site, all sorts of pictures and video of the event was captured. Among the rally goers were quite a few members of various militias, groups, and supporters of numerous radical movements, some of which had on tactical gear and other paraphernalia. Seen being used or worn in addition to these? The Punisher Skull. Though many photos of rioters and individuals around or inside the Capitol building show the skull, the one that received the most attention was that of Eric Munchell, aka Zip Tie Guy. Captured while he was clad in Cryptek camouflage and other tactical gear and equipment while jumping over a railing inside of the Senate Chamber's gallery, the photo was used to cross-reference with others to later identify him. One of the biggest factors aside from the zip tie handcuffs was that of the US flag patch which included the Punisher skull in the center. It was at this point many said that the skull had been lost to different ideas, groups, and movements, and that Marvel should retire it as the original symbolism of it had been too greatly distorted. So with that, we've more or less covered the history, adoption, and repurposing of the skull since its creation. But to fully understand its history, we must dive into why the symbol has reverberated so much among so many different people, why it has been co-opted by numerous groups, and finally, what, if anything, have the creators and holders of the intellectual property of the Punisher been doing about it? Now covering these groups through a non-biased lens, we'll quickly break down why said individuals and groups have adopted this symbol and why others can see it as contentious. Regarding the members of the military and other armed forces utilizing the skull, it has ties back to the Jolly Roger and Totenkopf, as said before. However, many use the fact that Frank was a veteran as another reason. They see Frank as a well-trained and disciplined warrior who essentially stands up for the weak and defenseless. He constantly has to deal with loss but at the same time keeps to his code and overall mission, regardless of the cost. This sentiment, in a way, is shown in issue number 8 of the 2014 run of the comics. In it, a soldier who Frank helped save from death at the expense of his own capture honors his sacrifice by wearing a skull patch while on tour in Afghanistan. Though it was a brief example, it somewhat shows the sentiment of brotherhood and camaraderie that is often seen in the service. Additionally, Frank doesn't kill police, military personnel, or indiscriminately, but rather those he deems evil and deserving. His skull is a symbol that can bring fear and intimidation to his enemies. Many troops can on different levels relate to this and feel the symbol can not only stand for that, but also actually intimidate and psychologically affect anyone they may go up against in battle. Now on the other hand, there are those who point out that Frank is a murderer. Though he fights and often kills those who are corrupt or evil, he still kills. And because of that, the symbol of a skull, specifically his, is tethered to death and violence. In the case of the British and Australians, they have banned the use of this skull in some instances, stating that it is a symbol of death and that though the military and many of its members do fight and often kill, they don't want to openly display such a theme. Moving on to police and law enforcement, their reasoning is somewhat similar. Frank fights for the innocent and defends those who can't defend themselves. He lives by a code and sticks to it. Being that he is oftentimes fighting criminals who range from average street thugs to members of organized crime, police officers who don his logo see themselves in his shoes to a certain extent. Those who say the symbol should not be worn by officers point out that he is a vigilante, who operates outside of the law. Because of his actions, he often ends up at odds with the police and other federal agencies. When one puts on his symbol, it can be interpreted as them being more radical and dangerous, and may be more willing to resolve confrontations or escalated situations through lethal means. Now, police wearing or using the skull has actually been addressed within the pages of a Punisher comic. In the Punisher issue 13, released in July of 2019, Frank is stopped by a pair of officers who suspect him of being related to a string of robberies. After a brief exchange, they realize who he is and quickly ask for a photo saying, guys in the group are not going to believe this. After showing him his logo on the side of their squad car and explaining how there are a few on the force who believe in what he does and that they're doing anything to clean up the streets, Frank rips off the decal and tears it up, saying that they are nothing alike. Cops take an oath to uphold the law and to help people. He doesn't. 
and if they need a role model, they should look to Captain America. Now, in relation to militias, far-right groups, conspiracy theorists, and politics, many see the skull as intimidating, which is often a tactic followers will utilize. Be it to scare people or bolster supporter morale, symbols among groups and ideas are a given, and if done correctly, have had history-changing connotations for both good or bad. In regards to the skull itself, many associated with the previously mentioned feel that, much like the Punisher, they have had no other choice but to take to the streets or go against the status quo, be that social norms or even the law. From militia groups who feel that their rights are being infringed upon, to followers of QAnon who believe that a secret cabal of sorts is controlling many factors of the government, and supporters of Donald Trump who see him as being unjustly treated, the symbol of the Punisher skull reverberates. On the other side, opponents of these groups see that the symbol ultimately emulates the idea of violence and killing to get the job done. Tethering such a symbol to a group or movement implies that the user has the capability and willpower to resort to such means to fulfill their goals or objectives. So, public opinions and arguments aside, what is actually being done regarding the skull from an official and legal standpoint? Well, it comes down to two issues, appropriation and the unlicensed creation, usage, and selling of merchandise and items. By this point, aside from the logo being used by all these groups, it had spread so far and wide that it was being put on countless items from clothing, decals, and car seat covers to pistol grips, thermoses, and flax. For example, while researching for this video, ads started popping up showing untold amounts of unlicensed and bootleg t-shirts and sweaters which had the skull on it. Enter the Walt Disney Company, which purchased Marvel outright in 2009 for 4.24 billion US dollars. Since then, they have expanded the IP exponentially through comics, merchandise, toys, movies, and television shows. The Punisher is no exception. In 2016, the second season of Daredevil premiered on Netflix. Following another Marvel hero, this season introduced the Punisher within the Marvel Cinematic Universe. After the season ended, the character, played by John Bernthal, went on to get its own show, which ran for two seasons. This reintroduction of the character prompted an influx in the Punisher's popularity, and as such put more pressure on Marvel and Disney to ensure not only the show and character were treated properly, but also as symbol. However, where Disney has been known to bring various entities and individuals to court over copyright infringement in the past, their approach was rather light to many of the remixes relating to the skull. When asked about police and political usage of it over the years, spokespeople often stated that the matter was being taken seriously, and later on they simply said that one should refer to the issue of the Punisher where Frank encounters the officers who use his symbol. Regardless though, many still called for the retirement of either the character himself or his logo, and though comic publishing did drop along with his show ending on Netflix, there seems to be no indication that the character or his story was coming to an end. In fact, as of this video's creation, rumors are swirling that a show may continue in some way, shape, or form on one of the Disney-owned streaming services. To wrap things up, we'll mention some more prominent individuals directly related to Frank Castle who did a bit more in response to the controversy surrounding the skull. Actor John Bernthal, who played Castle in the most recent show, shared a fan's artwork and post while responding to her, stating how the people wearing the skull who were involved in the storming of the Capitol had nothing to do with what Frank stands for or is about. Next is artist Mitch Garretts, who helped illustrate the 20-issue run of the 2014 comic series The Punisher. In it, he slightly redesigned the skull, giving it a more hard-edged, angular shape, which kept the overall look similar, but changed it enough to differentiate it from the widely used variant. Though this may have been a way to change things up comic book-wise, Garrods tweeted a few days after the Capitol storming about how he felt the logo should be retired for a time. The final and perhaps most outspoken individual is co-creator of The Punisher, Jerry Conway, who has been very vocal in addressing the many uses of the skull. By and large, he is opposed to the various iterations and adoptions as he feels they entirely miss the point and don't understand the character of the Punisher, what he stands for, and his methods. As a way to try and alter the perception of the skull, he began the fundraising initiative Skulls for Justice, which created t-shirts featuring designs promoting Black Lives Matter, all of which featured a version of the symbol. This was positively received by many, but others were quick to point out that it faces the same issues as the other uses, as it takes the logo out of context to be used for a different reason. But with that, we've pretty much covered all the points on the rather extensive yet interesting creation, usage, and evolution of the Punisher's skull symbol. Now, though this topic has had quite a history, it is still actively ongoing and sees many sides with many different opinions on the matter. As stated in the past, this channel approaches topics with a non-biased eye, so we've done our best to convey the information, 
messages and opinions surrounding the skull in a neutral and matter-of-fact way. Chances are the story with it is not yet done, and likely in the near future will continue to evolve and develop in some way, shape, or form. If that's the case, there may be some sort of update or part two made down the line. Additionally, consider this video as a first in an ongoing series that will look more into symbols and insignia used by armed forces and warriors throughout history. But anyway, thanks again for watching, be sure to like and subscribe, or just check back soon for more videos right here on Uniform History.